Team Soviet discovered the systematic cover-up of the true consequences of Chernobyl when the Soviet Empire dissolved in 1991. Taking advantage of the anarchy in the country, she managed to get her hands on a copy of top-secret documents, 600 pages of a report to the Central Committee, written while the Battle of Chernobyl was still raging. When I read these documents, I discovered everything happened differently. I realized just how huge a lie the party leaders told. A decree number 12 stated that on the 12th of May 1986, 10,198 people had already been hospitalized, 345 showed signs of radio lesions. Yet, at the same time, they were telling us everything was fine, that it was nothing serious, and I realized the scope of the lies. According to Allah, another passage reveals that authorities had arbitrarily changed the standards. Multiplying by five what was considered the acceptable dose of radiation for the human body. When they raised the standard, suddenly people were miraculously cured. They were released from the hospital and sent home. It was criminal. The tendency to manipulate the numbers was not unique to the Soviets. In late August 1986, the first international conference assessing Chernobyl took place behind closed doors. It was presided over by Hans Blix. No journalists or outside observers were admitted into the amphitheater. The Russian delegation was led by Legasov, the man who'd been in charge of the governmental commission during the Battle of Chernobyl. When we put him in charge of preparing the report for the IAEA, we gave him the duty of reporting everything. He came up with a very detailed report that put everybody in a state of shock. Legasov spoke for three hours. His report concluded that in the decades to come, about 40,000 deaths from cancer caused by Chernobyl were to be expected. The Western world refused flat out to accept this estimate, which spurred a genuine East-West negotiation. These are theoretical calculations based upon the Hiroshima model that you say that if you have uh, a certain radioactivity, you know from Hiroshima that the long-term effect was so and so many would, uh, would die from it. And if you then increase it by tenfold, you assume that it will be tenfold. Well, that's the calculation. Uh, this is not, I think, an exact, this is not empiric. There again, the figures were surprisingly flexible. By the end of the conference, people were no longer talking about 40,000, but rather of 4,000 probable deaths. Nearly 20 years later, in September 2005, this figure became the official death toll of the disaster. The staunchest opponents to the Soviet's policy of transparency were the French, who went as far as to deny that the radioactive cloud passed over their country. Est-ce qu'on a constaté quelque chose au-dessus de la France? Non, parce que les vents ne vont pas dans cette direction. Là, les vents tournent dans le sens inverse des lignes d'une montre. Il n'y a pas lieu du tout de s'inquiéter. C'est sans aucun danger pour la santé publique. 20 years later, in France, and especially in Corsica, cases of thyroid cancer of the same nature and severity as those around Chernobyl are being reported. The most dangerous element that came out of the Chernobyl reactor wasn't cesium or plutonium, but lies. The lie of 86, that's what I call it. A lie that was propagated like the radioactivity throughout the whole country and the entire world. On the 27th of April 1988, the second anniversary of the disaster, Legasov, who'd worked so hard to unveil the entire truth, decided to put an end to his life. Today, as perfect metaphors of the institutionalized lie, the radioactive particles hurled from the reactor in the explosion continue to poison the land. 20 years after the disaster, the area of Chernobyl remains uninhabitable.
земле, если попадают радионуклиды, то в земле... In five years, the radionuclides sink five centimeters into the contaminated soil. So, 20 years later, they're 20 centimeters under the ground. They continue to contaminate all the plants. To clean it up, we'd need to remove 20 centimeters of soil and seal it underground in burial sites. And that's too big of a job to do. It's impossible. Today, 8 million people live in contaminated areas of the Ukraine, Russia, and especially Belarusia. For 20 years, they've lived off the radioactive food that continues to contaminate them little by little. This issue, raised in 1986 by the Soviet delegation at the Vienna Conference, has been systematically ignored. And yet, 1,152 children were treated for thyroid cancer between 1986 and 2002 at a specialized center in Minsk. How many in other cities? No global statistics have yet been made public. One doctor, Yuri Bandayevsky, has been studying illnesses among the populations in the contaminated areas ever since the disaster. When his findings were published in 1996, they were immediately condemned. Arrested and officially sentenced for corruption, he spent the next five years in jail. In November 2005, he was still under house arrest. Look what happened when the mother was contaminated with cesium during pregnancy in one single family. Look how many deformations, hair lip, missing eyes, deformed skulls. These embryos come from hamsters that were fed only contaminated grass from the region of Gomel. The result? Entire litters of deformed animals. I was horrified by how many deformed embryos developed in animals that had eaten cesium-contaminated food. I obtained a horrible number of deformations in two weeks. Usually, when you encounter a monster, you describe it. You're certainly familiar with Peter the Great's Kunstkamera Museum in St. Petersburg. Quite frankly, I myself could create as many monsters as I wanted. There's been no official study of genetic mutations stemming from Chernobyl. Yet despite the thousands of miscarriages and abortions that took place following the disaster, there seems to be hundreds of children who suffer the effects of radiation. The deformations we see among these children are similar to those of Bandayevsky's hamsters. In Belarusia, 300,000 children are currently suffering the consequences of contamination. NGOs like the International Green Cross, founded by Gorbachev after he was sidelined from the government in 1991, have opened treatment and support centers for victims of Chernobyl. They also organize therapeutic camps, aiming to teach the new generations in contaminated areas how to live with radioactivity. Like here, testing the contamination of their food. How many years is this going to go on? 800 years? 800 years. Until the second Jesus Christ is born. Until his return? Yes. Chernobyl played an important role for us all. And of course, we must keep searching and not skimp on millions. We must strengthen international cooperation and create international scientific centers to find new sources of energy which are safer. That's the essential issue. I wouldn't wish for anyone, not my friends or my enemies, to experience such a tragedy. No one deserves to live through what we did in Chernobyl. We're all human beings, and no one deserves that. In the heart of the zone, 10 kilometers from the nuclear power plant, and hidden in the forest, lies Chernobyl II. Twenty years ago, no one could get near this huge military radar. Moscow's hidden eye meant to spot American missiles. The fact it was put out of service after the explosion 
tallies with what the Chernobyl accident seemed to foreshadow. Using weapons is a terrible thing, and nuclear weapons are even worse. Chernobyl was an accident involving one single reactor, a limited accident, whose consequences are still with us. We've had two bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There again, the consequences are still being felt today. Chernobyl showed us the true nature of nuclear energy in human hands. We'd calculated that our most powerful missile, the SS-18, was as powerful as 100 Chernobyl. The SS-18 was the warhead the Americans feared the most. And we had 2,700 of them. And these were the missiles we'd intended for the Americans. 2,700. Imagine the destruction. Mr. Gorbachev was probably right in saying that Chernobyl was an, a big illustration of radioactivity let loose and in this sense suggested to people more vividly that we ought to do away with the nuclear weapons. A year and a half after Chernobyl, Gorbachev retired all nuclear warheads with a range of 500 to 5,000 kilometers. Ten years later, the total nuclear test ban treaty was ratified by the entire world, with the exception of India. Chernobyl marked the beginning of disarmament for the world's greatest nuclear rivals. Chernobyl convinced everyone, Soviets and Americans alike, realized once and for all the magnitude of the atomic volcanoes our countries were sitting upon. Not just our two countries, but the entire world. The entire world. Yet 20 years later, the Chernobyl disaster and its lessons seem to be fading from memory. Meanwhile, beneath the aging sarcophagus of reactor number four, the poison remains deadly. Since 2001, the three Chernobyl reactors have been shut down once and for all. But 20 years after the explosion, a dosometer flies off the chart at the base of the sarcophagus. High levels of radioactivity, a hundred times above normal, are still contaminating the plant's surroundings. The structure has been weakened by rain and erosion. Since its construction, 3,000 liquidators have been watching over it, trying to ward off damage. We built the sarcophagus to last 30 years, thinking that 30 years after the explosion, we could build a new sarcophagus without people having to run because of high radiation levels. 20 years have gone by and nothing's been done yet, and it's urgent that it gets replaced. But the Ukraine doesn't have any more money. Neither do we. A new sarcophagus is underway, but its construction is already 10 years behind schedule. It is a structure 108 meters high, meant entirely to cover the first sarcophagus. It will cost $1 billion. An international fund led by Hans Blix has been set up. We still are, have not put the new sarcophagus on it. It will be ready in a couple of years' time. When that is done, well, then they can, in due course, later on remove the masses of spent fuel or of melted fuel, which is there. Twenty years after the explosion, the cooled magma at the reactor's core, 14 meters underground, is still a terrible threat, and will remain so for years to come. I pray God the sarcophagus never collapses. That would be the worst thing that could happen, because inside there are 100 kilograms of plutonium. One microgram is a lethal dose for a human being. That means there is enough plutonium to poison a hundred million people. The half-life of plutonium, in other words, the time it takes for half of the plutonium to disappear, is 245,000 years. This is something we could thus consider eternal. There are areas where there will never be life again. Despite this terrible warning, the nuclear disarmament sparked by Chernobyl is clearly coming into question.